This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. This is the BBC. Hello, welcome to the podcast version of Shortcuts. My name's Josie Long. We're recording this late at night in my house and you'll be able to hear my neighbours moving around and the occasional car. I hope that you're listening to this late at night. It's a perfect episode for a late night swatting session, if you're swatting, (laughs) or a, a very early morning insomnia session. So I hope that this proves useful to you in either of those contexts. It's a very quiet evening in London. Just sat outside my front door. It's nice when it feels like there's a bit of a lull in the activities <laughs> that everyone's sort of taking a bit of time off. Rising in the, in the background as well as that moped is a recording from Berlin also at night so hopefully you're in two places at the same time united by the night time that's the voice of Phil Smith singing he's coming home from a late night gig with his accordion enjoying an ad hoc Al fresco performance. He saw a rainstorm creeping towards him, approaching and then enveloping the music around him. This is Shortcut. Brief encounters, true stories, radio adventures, and found sound. Today, Silent Night. At at night in prison, the sound stops being so much from the wing and starts being more from the outside world. I crossed half a world, I risked being eaten by hyenas to have a recording I can find on any sound library that I already have. Whether it's cars beeping or a high-speed train, I think that outside sounds, they're comforting. If you listen carefully, what you can hear in the background is the boiler firing up and the heating going on in my house. There's an atmospheric shift, which I think is a sound shift as well, which happens when everyone else in the house that you're in has fallen asleep. You can even feel it when somebody's lying next to you It's a change in the quality of their breathing and the sounds of their breath. You just know that they're no longer in the room with you, their head is somewhere else, they've checked out. And it's really interesting because even though you can hear the other people around you, those sounds really tell you that you're alone. The daytime soundscape of prison is super harsh. Keys, slamming doors and people shouting. That's like the baseline doors being smashed shut. They're these giant Victorian steel doors that hit the frame and make a big resonating kind of dong. There's the mid of people just shouting 24-7 in some prisons. There's tannoys going off telling you to get to this place and asking for this prisoner to come to the office. And then there's the treble of the, the keys tinkling and and they're all quite aggressive sounds and then you've got to remember that the environment of prison is very brittle ceramic solid there's no soft furnishings there's no pictures on the wall and there's not much to break the reverberation of the sound 
I, I think the soundscape of prison is a good metaphor for the mental scape of prison. The sounds bounce around without much to absorb them in the same way that your thoughts bounce around without much to absorb them. After bang up, that's when you all get your doors closed. All you can really hear is a few people shouting at each other, but mostly it's just TVs. Two thirds of the wing will be watching EastEnders all at the same time. So when you hear the theme tune kick in, it's this kind of incredible surround sound effect. 300 separate TVs, like dun, 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 da, 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 da. And another highlight is when Crime Watch is on, because people are always cheering on people who have run away from the police. Everyone likes a wily criminal, and especially when the Hat and Garden people are out and about. We're looking for six elderly males, and they'd be like, Go on, Terry! <laughs> it all goes silent quite quickly, and the sound stops being so much from the wing, and potentially depending on where your prison is located, starts being more from the outside world. I think that outside sounds, they're comforting anything from the outside world that passes over the fence, whether it's cars beeping or a high-speed train. I think that it, you know, it can have the dual effect of making you feel kind of reticent and, and sad that you're inside but also comforting. I do remember waking up at four in the morning in prison and it was so absolutely quiet. It was ceramic. The nothingness rebounds in a weird way off of those bald walls. You're not tired because you haven't really been doing much if you haven't been to the gym. There's not much to put your mind to. There's not much texture and you don't realise what it's like to do that night upon night upon night upon night. And I mean, I did it for a year, but some people do it for 20. In the morning, the prison officers will walk down the wing and you hear the sound of the keys coming towards you. You can hear the first cells getting unlocked. So the next cell is... And then you're like, is it me next? And there's another one. Ding, 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 ding. You hear the key enter your door and you're out. And immediately, straight off the bat, people are playing pop, heart FM, grime, some drum and bass going on. It's probably me with my old hip hop tape or whatever. 7.30 in the morning. i got to say, most people can't handle that level of noise. I think that my prison experience probably made my hunger for chaotic sounds more extreme. While I sleep, I often use these eight-hour YouTube videos of fires crackling or soothing water. The one I like the most is the tropical storms. It's got the, the tin roof buckling and the palm trees falling to the ground and the texture, that kind of background noise helps me to be I think I think it helps my sleep patterns The voice of former prisoner Carl Catamar and that was produced by Tom Glasser Tom and Carl have just made a documentary together featured on National Prison Radio called Sound Inside as part of it, they spent a night in a notoriously loud wing. And despite all of the sounds, Carl was straight out to sleep like a light. But Tom spent the whole night awake, racked with anxiety. We're in my house, we're the only people here, just me and the producer. And I'd really thought it would have a kind of monastic enveloping silent quality to it it would be almost haunting and enigmatic and yet what you can actually hear is the sound of the radiator filling up with water and the fridge going in the background and the boiler coming on every now and again 
and the fleeting sounds of my upstairs neighbours listening to the Champions League football match. And what it's really hit home to me is that there is no such thing as a perfect silence. Unfortunately, in our next story, the Italian producer Jonathan Zenti comes to the exact same conclusion, but he has to travel halfway across the world in order to do so. There's a folder on my external backup hard drive with all my favourite recordings I never used. It's a bit weird to keep useless recordings, but I like to go back to them once in a while. They remind me of those pretentious moments in my life when I feel I'm doing something special. Like this file that drives my memory to that time I thought I was going to record the perfect silence. The file's name is Crickets Night Masai Mara. I'm in Kenya in 2015. I've been here for a couple of weeks now to make some interviews about women's health. I told the NGO that has sent me here that to be effective we need to go to remote areas as far as possible from Nairobi to collect real stories from real people of the countryside. That's how I tricked them into a kind of paid safari. Tonight, me and my guide Bernard are going to sleep at the guest house of a tiny Maasai Christian community on the border that divides Kenya and Tanzania not far from the Serengeti Park. Around the compound, there's nothing, just a hazel, warm savanna. Reaching this piece of land after 12 hours of rough road, I realize there's no way I'll find myself again in a place like this. As long as I am here, I want to collect every sound I can. My hunting for a special sound starts staring with a giant microphone in my hands in front of these singers who play for me an hypnotic, undeserved Masai song. I record every sonority of a restoring welcome tea. Are you having fun of me? I'm, I'm already <laughs> teaching you, eh? I'm already teaching you what we do. Uh-huh. We are now collecting sound effects. You know so when you listen to your radio, you think it is real. But it was just done like this and the put it. <laughs> it's 10 p.m. Everything is quiet and it's time to go to sleep. I stop by the kitchen to record all the small sounds, the windows, the sink. And then the young housekeeper asks me to go to bed. Can we take my tea and then we go? Yeah. He tells me he has to be the last one around and I shouldn't stray outside the room before the sun rises because during the night many animals come around in search for food, especially hyenas. But I'm not ready to call it a day yet. I still miss that special, unique sound that I'm looking for. So I wait and when I don't see anyone around, I cover myself with mosquitoes repellent, I turn on the recorder and I sneak out. But the housekeeper sees my torchlight and he tells me to go back into the room for my safety. Yeah, turn it off, turn it off. Yeah, yeah. I got it. And then I sneak out again without the light. I sit on a small step in a deep, deep dark. And when I focus myself on what is coming out from my earphones, I realize that what I'm hearing is not silence. Actually, I'm recording crickets. Compared to the sound of the everyday life I'm used to, This noise is quiet. But this is not the perfect silence I wanted to catch. I crossed half a word, I risked being eaten by hyenas, 
to have a recording I can find on any sound library that I already have. I could record a better silence in any church back home. I better turn the recorder off and go back to my room. I have another pretentious moment to add to my useless recording folder on my backup hard drive. It's not the perfect silence I was looking for, but it's a kind of silence I started missing as soon as I got back to the hustle and bustle of the city. I didn't change the history of sound, but I'm happy to have this shelter of quietness where I can hide myself once in a while. This file that I called Cricket's Night Masai Mara. So we just moved into the other room in the flat in the hope that we create a kind of perfect monastic ambience. But unfortunately, whilst we've lost the boiler in the fridge, we've gained the upstairs neighbours listening quite prominently to the football and occasionally expressing strident opinions and stamping around. What I found quite funny about Jonathan's piece is that he had this idealised image that by going into a very stripped back, very natural place, there'd be no sound and forgetting that, of course, the chaos of nature is always there. It's like the idea that if you go out into the middle of nowhere, you'll be in this perfect pitch-dark night, and actually what you find is you see more stars than you've ever seen in your life. You've got a canopy of bright stars, or the bright moon illuminating the night, so you're lit up far more than if you were on a suburban street with one little broken street lamp. Our last story features the voice of Jordan Scott, who's a poet who also has a stutter. He was researching a connection that he'd observed in his own life, which is the more that he stutters, the more people in power assume that he's lying. His research brought him to studying interrogation transcripts from Guantanamo Bay, in which interrogators also interpreted detainees' stutters as signs of their dishonesty. Jordan decided to apply to tour the prison so he could speak to interrogators and linguists who were working there and learn more. But he knew that it was very difficult to be allowed on one of these tours, so in order to appear less threatening, he applied for the visit as a poet. Guantanamo officials said that Jordan wouldn't be able to speak to any interrogators or linguists. He wouldn't be able to record unauthorised human voices. So Jordan had to change tactic very quickly. He asked if he could record the ambient noises around him. When he arrived, the shorthand explanation of what he was doing became that he was recording ambient sound for poetry, even though in reality he wasn't sure what use he would find for the recordings while he was taking them. This recording starts in a part of Guantanamo called Camp X-Ray. Camp X-Ray now stands abandoned and overgrown with nature because it's the site of an active war crimes investigation into the torture that happened there. Walking towards the fence of Camp X-Ray. I started walking up uh, uh, to get inside the prison. Outside the fence, Camp X-Ray at night. And the moon was bright, but not that, but not that bright. And the military escort who was with me, he's afraid of snakes, so he didn't want to go with me. So he left me alone, and he stayed at the van, and I walked up. Recording inside of one of the abandoned cells at Camp X-Ray. Inside another cell at Camp X-Ray. Another cell, Camp X-Ray. I just wanted to try to get 
a sense of how the, the, the landscape would sound at night for the people that were um, held there at one time. Oftentimes they were just put on a plane from Afghanistan with um, hoods on and head and head and headphones on. What were those sounds that these men were hearing for the first time? As soon as you get off the, the, the plane, uh, because it's so hot there, all, all you really hear are those are the sounds of the generators and air uh, conditioners. After every day, I, I recorded myself uh, describing uh, that particular day. The whole place is, is totally restricted. You can't go anywhere without an escort. Everywhere you uh, went, like there's no, uh, you can't take any of uh, the pictures, uh, you can't talk to people. Uh, uh, but this is the thing. They did not know what to do. They did not know what to do with me. I would say, uh, can I uh, the, go into uh, uh, Camp Iguana? And they would say, absolutely not. And I said, well, I want to just, I want to do ambient sound. And they're like, oh, okay. I, I don't see an issue with that, right? That we would have something called um, operational security. Uh, meetings where our uh, material was looked uh, uh, through to make sh sure that it did not compromise uh, security, is what they called it. Uh, what I started to find is that operational security uh, meetings would go very quickly uh, for me. There, there's, there's got nothing in the. Um, um, ambient s sound uh, uh, from their perspective that would compromise th the dominant uh, narrative that they uh, want to sell of the of the prison. Uh, when I was able to speak to the uh, warden himself, I asked him what sounds does he hear in a regular day. If you're asking me if there's a lot of shouting, and not at all. I'm just n not at all. Just no. just in t t t terms of ambient sounding. Air conditioners is about air conditioning. Right. Okay. Thank you. Right before I went to Guantanamo Bay, Guantanamo Diary by uh, Muhammad uh, Salahi was uh, released. There's a particular passage in it um, describing. Uh, one of the ways that he is tortured at Guantanamo. He is placed in in a cold room uh, with, with a very uh, little uh, clothes on. And this was one of the ways that they were trying to get him uh, to, uh, to, con to confess to something that he did not, uh, 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 to something that he did not do. Once you understand that that, that that machine is actually a vehicle of torture, you can't unhear it. X-ray inter interrogation booth. Inside the interrogation shed, you can see the remnants of an air conditioner on the side. Once I stepped out, I knew something was wrong because there was headlights uh, to my right. And uh, to my uh, left, uh, racing down uh, the road uh, towards the entrance 
of a camp x-ray. I, I shouldn't have been there. I was alone, and this particular shed was not part of the tour when we were there in the afternoon, so I know I pushed it somehow. I walked quickly down the hill. All of the military vehicles who had arrived, they all had their lights on in like a semi-circle. My military as you know, the court, he looked really uh, nervous. There was this one guard who was uh, the most intense of the bunch. He walked aggressively towards me to meet me in the middle of the um, headlights. And then uh, the questioning uh, started after that. Why are you here? Do you have permission to be here? What are you doing here? Were you up there alone? Do you know what this means to be here without permission? The questions were coming so quickly and aggressively by Marine S, you know, escort. He finally answers. He's recording ambient sounds for a poem, sir. Everything stopped. There's a, a poet, uh, Peter Gizzi, who once said in an interview that poetry I can be a mystery in the face of violence. Ambient sound could sound like something in the background or something that's not important, when in actuality, these sounds they tell us something that that escapes uh, the sensors that exist at the prison. These recordings at Guantanamo, they uh, form a kind of witnessing. Uh, the guard turned away the, the, uh, from us. He got on the radio, and all you could hear was, Yes, sir. Camp X-ray, sir. A poem, sir. Yes, sir. A poem. Yes. Ambient, sir. Yes, sir. A poem. And then he turned back towards us and said, Get out of here. That was made for us by Jess Shane, and it featured the voice of Jordan Scott. You can exist in a place that you convince yourself is silent, but it takes somebody else to hear the truth of everything that's around you. Thank you so much for listening to Shortcuts. If you enjoyed the show, you can find many more programmes to listen to and download at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Now I am going to go to sleep. (laughs) Good night.